There's black excellence everywhere that you turn and look. As teaching black history becomes political, we are creating a safe space to promote learning. This history is so important and it's hard to imagine not having the opportunity to learn it. You see the folks that honor that history by moving it forward. People all across the country are ensuring that the legacy of our ancestors remains preserved. We want people to experience black art of all colors. Show the positive contributions that African Americans have made to our society. Black culture has shaped the history of America from slavery to today. This is how it was all over the country. It's such an important story to tell. We wouldn't be where we're at without our ancestors. It's why we are highlighting the work that our communities are doing to protect history and the future. I want to thank you all for joining us here. I'm Nicole Baker, evening anchor for CBS News Texas. At a time when teaching black history has become political, we're taking a moment to shine a spotlight on how communities are preserving black history in and out of the classroom. We begin in a classroom making history by teaching it. Chicago Chardé Gray takes us inside the AP African American history class. Did that ever come up in the schools with the teachers, the kids? You're like, nope. This is a class many haven't taken. As a matter of fact, it's a first of its kind. We are actually one of the pilot schools for the AP program, period. Dr. Tyrone Williams is talking about the AP African American History class. He's teaching it at Oak Park and River Forest High School, the first high school in the entire state to pilot the program. So far, it's a hit with the students. This history is so important and it's hard to imagine not having the opportunity to learn it. I think it's a really entertaining class because history classes will teach you a lot about African Americans and where it originated and how we got to America. But what I really appreciate about this class is how it goes into depth about where it happened, how it happened, when it happened, with who it happened. OPRF is one of only 60 high schools nationwide chosen to be a part of the College Board's national rollout. Because I always forget that this isn't just like the normal class for everyone in the country because, I don't know, it feels like that. Even though it's new, uh, it, it feels like a, a class that, that should have been here before, like before this time. Dr. William addresses his students by calling them scholars. Scholars, Zoe. They amaze me. I mean, the way they show up every single day, prepared and ready to go, um, there's no other way for me to do it. We've gone through, like, history of Ethiopia, uh, places like that, and how, like, the movement of the people in those areas. The instructions also includes lessons on black queer studies, reparations, and movements like Black Lives Matter, content that was rejected by Florida's education department. Uh, we don't need to give life to that, right? But the reality is our young people, they won't have the luxury um, that those folks that are pushing a consensus agenda. More than a year ago, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis defended his decision to block a high school advanced placement course on African-American studies, saying the course's inclusion of lessons on black queer theory and the prison abolition movement didn't meet the state's standards. Whether people want to um, you know, support it or not, right, we have right, to connect meaningful in this country in order to move our democracy along. People should know that this class is relevant to their history, whether they think it or not, but African-American history is everybody's history. In Florida, a state in the center of the fight over teaching black history, the Black History Project offers classes to students who want to learn about black history outside of school. Tanya Francois takes us there. A uh, one, four, eight. I feel like in school, we're not being taught enough. We're being taught the basics every single year. I take U.S. history for 11th grade, and there's things that's covered, but it's not in depth because we only have so much time. J.C. Nails and Mahalia Camille say what they're taught about black history at their respective schools is disappointing. It's why they come to the African American Research Library and Cultural Center in Fort Lauderdale to take this free once a month class sponsored by the Black History Project. I've learned so much in this class that sometimes it's hard to even understand what I learned because it's so deep and rich in what 
happens and what's happened and what people try to hide. And this, the teachers, they're just amazing. The teacher is Kevin Fair. Simply creating a law saying don't make children feel guilt, don't indoctrinate, understood. Now how do we do this the right way according to your laws, your standards, your mandates? Where are the teaching tools? Where are the resources? Rather than wait on those resources, Mr. Fair took his lessons to the library. I, in my real life, teach at a majority white school. And the reaction is the same for my majority white, or for my white and my uh, black students and my Hispanic students. Kids, if you ask them if they what they learned in school for Black History Month, they would say, "Oh, my teacher gave me a project. You have to search up one famous person from Black History, and it would probably be like a famous celebrity, um, a famous black celebrity, or something like that." It helps me personally find out where I come from and how resilient the people that I come from are, making me feel better about, more confident when I walk in a room or more happy when it's Black History Month. Pittsburgh's Three Rivers are known for 200 years of transporting coal and steel. What you may not know is those same rivers transported freedom seekers all along the Underground Railroad. And while many hiding spots along the route are no longer standing, Mamie Baugh traced just a few, revealing their very important history. The rivers play a, a major role in Pittsburgh history. Converging rivers, creating a point of hope. When you look at it from a freedom standpoint, it has a real significance. Aiding enslaved black people on their quest to break the shackles and find freedom. It was a clandestine operation, often taking place under the night sky. The Underground Railroad was a secret passageway, not made of gravel and rail but of abolitionists who believed in the cause. Built in 1839, situated along the riverfront, the Monongahela House Hotel was the first hotel many encountered in Pittsburgh. It was a convenient stop on the Freedom Train. It was owned by an abolitionist, and he employed a number of African-American abolitionists. Some believe the hotel workers were conductors, helping many escapees, including a teenager locked in a hotel room by her owner. When he returned, she was nowhere to be found. It's speculated that the workers at the Monongahela House Hotel were involved with getting her out of that room without unlocking the door, and they were able to pull her up through the transit above the door. For some travelers, Pittsburgh was their final stop on the journey to emancipation. Others continued moving further north. Lanterns signaled safe havens throughout Allegheny County, the north side, Mount Washington, and downtown. This is a replica of one stop. It's a bathhouse owned by abolitionist and business owner John Vachon. It was all to help freedom seekers um, sort of refresh themselves but change their appearance. Uh, to make their escape from slavery successful. One of the last remaining parts of the Underground Railroad in Allegheny County sits on a hilltop in Mount Washington, the home of abolitionist and attorney Thomas Bigham, built in 1849. It's one of the few survivors of, of a pivotal era in American history. Not much has changed, from the hardwood floors to the window glass. Even this dirt road behind the home, called Joe Lane, named after Bigham's oldest son. Back then, it was the only way to and from the residence, up until 1931. People wouldn't know who was coming and staying, and uh, so there was very little chance that the sheriff would know that there were escaped slaves in the neighborhood. They would hide out in the barn once attached to the home or in this attic that has an extension. This room has a hatchway that goes to an enormous attic. This house is one of the few houses still standing in Allegheny County that is a documented stop on the Underground Railroad. A part of Pittsburgh's past that lives on through the old brick in Mount Washington and our waterways. In the water. Pittsburgh was a very militant area. They were willing to fight. 
uh, in the course of the uh, abolitionist movement. And there were many instances here where um, conflict arose over helping to free someone. We don't know how many. That's part of Pittsburgh's missing history. But they found a path forward along the Ohio River, which some called the River Jordan, and a reminder of the forgotten past. In Pittsburgh, I'm Mamie Ba. Maryland. It was once home to hundreds of segregated schoolhouses. Paul Gessler takes us inside one of them to show us the preservation of the past for future generations. Nestled next to a horse farm in Northeast Maryland. This is one of the early towns of Harford County. A two-story schoolhouse sits just off Castleton Road. We are near the Susquehanna River. Inside, a time capsule. You come in here, you're transformed back in time. Back to the 1860s, back to Reconstruction. It's still standing, still strong. Hosanna School was built as a Freedmen's Bureau schoolhouse, the first of four in Harford County. Parents would attend school with the students and perhaps grandparents who attended school with their children. Imagine going to school with your mom and dad. <laughs> we wouldn't think of that today. Education once denied. So you step in here, you step back in time. Now within reach. You cannot tell American history without all these nuances. Photos of its final teachers are featured at the front of the class. I mean, they, they were way more than just teachers. Hosanna closed in the 1940s. So this is the second floor schoolhouse, schoolroom. Yes. It serves the community now as a museum and event space, housing historic reminders and relics of the decades of separate unequal schools. Another Freedmen's Bureau schoolhouse, the McComas Institute in Joppa, was also built in 1867. Hosanna Community House purchased it in 2017 to save it from tax sale and preserve it. And similar efforts are underway at other African-American schoolhouses across the state. I remember this room being the first grade when I started out in school. Charles Givens recalls when he was six years old. It was 1951 at Elkton Colored School. The teacher's desk was basically in the middle of this room. Givens is now an Elkton Town Commissioner and part of the years-long effort to turn his old segregated schoolhouse from eyesore to attraction. That's what we hope this school, this museum, the cultural center becomes, a tourist attraction. Just because it looks broke today doesn't mean that it will stay broke. Cecil County sold the property to the town in 2020 for a hefty sum. For one dollar. One dollar to jumpstart what will likely be a six year process to turn this old Julius Rosenwald school into a museum as well. There's a lot of people in Elton right now and doesn't even know that this school even existed. There's a lot of people in Elton didn't know that this was an all black school. The building is truly an artifact. Morgan State professor and project architect Dale Green says the many layers of the building will inform the restoration process. Seeking to preserve this place really sends a signal to the community that this place mattered and that this place still matters. Maryland had at one point more than 150 so-called Rosenwald schools named after the philanthropist Julius Rosenwald built in partnership with Booker T. Washington. There were more than 5,000 throughout the American South during the Jim Crow era. Many schools were shuttered or demolished after the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court ruling in 1954. This was a forgotten school. It was a forgotten project. Forgotten no longer. This school initially started with 560 square feet of space. The now 15,000 square foot facility will soon shine light on a once dark time. Just because we experienced a dark day in our history doesn't mean that we need to stay there. And so it's important that we share that history. There is a story right there that needs to be told. You know, we came here, we were educated, we didn't have the best education, but for a few of us and many of us, we were able to take what little we had and go out in life and make something of ourselves. Back at Hosanna, a symbol of what Elkton Colored School can be in a few years. This is how it was all over the country. It's such an important story to tell. Hurricane Hazel had ripped off its roof in the 1950s. It took decades to revive this remnant of a racist past. Make sure you bring your children so they can learn this history. It's so important for the understanding of American history and who we are today.
We know black history isn't only in books. Jesse Mitchell shows us how the community is preserving black history, this time on the streets of New York City. The first black church established in the state of New York, Mother AME Zion, still stands strong along a quiet street in Harlem, home to an incomparable history. We are still here. 227 years later. So that seems to tell me that we still have a mission that God has for us. Since 1796, Mother AME served as a sanctuary for enslaved Africans escaping through the Underground Railroad and boasted members like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. Teacher Chloe Jones loves sharing her fellow members' stories with her students. The first one was Dabney Montgomery, who was a Tuskegee Airman. But growing up, he was Uncle Dab. Well, I remember the pews being filled. And my family used to sit on this side of the church. Milagro Centron is a third generation member here, and she's raising her children to know about those who came before them. So this is the history of the church? Yeah. Membership has shrunk from more than a thousand to fewer than a hundred, and the building needs more than a few repairs. Yet 17 year old Josiah proudly spreads the word among his peers. If you go to a museum but don't understand anything that's in it, there's no point of going to the museum. I feel like the church is not just a place in its own, but the people surrounded. They're the ones who fought, and it's important. And if we forget that, it's like letting them down. Nowadays, Frederick Douglass greets visitors to the New York Historical Society with a selfie station and an ongoing exhibit inside that highlights his contributions to the fight for equal rights. It's really intrinsic to the work that we're doing. We're always looking for new ways to touch people's lives and stories that can really get them excited. In a hallway above him, a new display reveals the black men behind the world's most famous foot race, the New York City Marathon. Joe Yancey and the New York Pioneer Club helped establish the first AAU track team in Harlem in 1942. His trainee, Ted Corbett, became the first black man to run an Olympic marathon 10 years later. It wasn't until 1970 that Corbett's Roadrunners Club created the city's first marathon, and Corbett designed the path that touches all five boroughs, still in use today. Public schools have an important role, giving children a solid foundation in American history. And museums, because we're using objects, we relate to people in a totally different way. Tangible artifacts help impact understanding. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote the science fiction short story, The Comet, in 1920. Today, artist Tim Fielder is turning it into a graphic novel. The NAACP founder delved into what would become Afrofuturism, imagining the tale of a black man alone in an apocalypse with a white woman, forcing a racial reckoning. It's a challenge. We have to go through a breakdown period of the script, then breakdown period of the visuals, and then move towards final artwork. With decades of support from the Children's Art Carnival in Harlem, he's part of a community of artists who have hosted immersive workshops for neighborhood kids since 1969. What are kids getting here that they're not getting in the classroom? Love. And I'm saying that as a career educator, the message was, you're safe here, you're welcome here, this is a happy place, this is a creative place. Fielder's previous comic, The Graphic History of Hip Hop, has been distributed throughout New York City public schools as a supplemental education tool, and he hopes for similar support on this project. He already has the blessing of Du Bois's descendants. I'm proud of doing this, and I'm proud of adding this project to my own bibliography, but to the lexicon of Afrofuturism. Sparking a conversation among a younger generation. Once upon a time, people of my skin color didn't have the opportunity to learn in. I'm gonna take advantage of this time to fight those odds. I will be an educated black man in America, no matter what happens. Jesse Mitchell, CBS News, New York. History really comes alive in a traveling museum, teaching a Philadelphia community about race. Here's Brandon Goldner. At Galloway Township Middle School. Come a little closer. Teachers are stepping aside. My personal favorite is the Piggy Wiggy. And letting the students do the teaching. There's a lot of soul food restaurants back around at Atlantic City. Eighth grader Om Patel is one of 24 students acting as docents or voluntary guides for their classmates. We're acting like it's a little museum, so people will come around and they can look at all the stuff. A little museum focusing on a big topic, redlining in Atlantic City during the Jim Crow era. Redlining is a form of racial discrimination in which government maps in the 1900s outlined areas in red where black residents lived and declared those neighborhoods high risk, depriving those communities of needed investment. His name is Roger. Roger. 
Ralph Hunter is the founder of the African American Heritage Museum of Southern New Jersey, which hosts this event. He takes exhibits like this one to schools all across the tri-state area. They're going to have to deal with people of all different races once they get to high school, once they get to college. So we're kind of preparing them and letting them know the great accomplishment of people of color. And a lot of these restaurants were around on the same avenue. Critical to the museum's mission is having students teach these topics to their classmates. Things you learn today, if you put them to memory, once you have them there, you're not going to lose them. So it's important to me that these students learn this now. And all these restaurants are pretty close, but they're all really famous in their different ways. Patel says it's important to learn about black history subjects that don't get as much attention. Because you don't want to leave out all the people that have like their own experiences. We want to incorporate stuff around in our school. Creating an inclusive environment for all students by including discussions on complex topics in black history. A San Francisco parent is volunteering his time to build a community for black students. Max Darrow tells us all about the history and life lessons that they're sharing there. <laughs> Laughter is mixed in with learning and business around this table at Uloa Elementary. All right, and so... That's El Khalid McCree, a parent volunteer, keeping everyone on track during this get-together of the Black Student Union. What do you like about science? They meet every other week to learn about and celebrate black excellence and to build community. The first order of business on this day... Can we come up with a date when you guys want to do the drive? They're planning on giving back to the community by collecting and distributing cases of water to those in need. We have two Aprils and one May. Next up, a brief history lesson about two black inventors. There's black excellence everywhere that you turn and look. Dr. Gladys West, who helped to develop GPS, and Lewis Howard Latimer, who helped make incandescent light bulbs become more affordable and practical in the late 1800s. Well, it's important to know that there are people that look like us who have done amazing things on this planet called Earth. After a history lesson about electricity and light. Hold up your lights. McCree got into a life lesson about the importance of being a light. So you, we want to build up powerful relationships by what? Being positive or negative? Being positive, right? Be exactly what she is, and that's a bright light, holding her light and trying to make change. Which is what he is on a mission to do. I have an opportunity to make a difference in a child's life. So many people have made an impact on my life. And so I don't take for granted the opportunity when presented to make that impact. Principal Melissa Ju and Assistant Principal Sunny Wong are proud to partner with McCree. Kids, they teach us what they need. BSU has been at Yulo for quite a few years. It has um, evolved over the years. We have only a handful of African-American students at school, and we want to give them a safe space where they can um, find rapport with one another, share, um, learn, and um, connect it to the community. It gives kids an opportunity to realize that they are all uniquely um, um, wonderful and should be um, celebrated. I want to see all kids have an opportunity to do what they want to do in life. Take one, pass it down. There is a lot McCree hopes the kids will learn from their get-togethers. But there is one thing in particular he wants to make sure they know. Oh, that's the easiest question you ask, is love. The fact that they are loved and that they are appreciated. But not only that, but they have a responsibility to, to take what we're giving them, which is love, to their community, to their family, and to be a beacon of light like we talked about today. Wisdom we can all take to heart. Just always remember that you guys are bright lights, okay? Minnesota's Susan Elizabeth Littlefield met two men using a platform to educate a non-black audience about the experience of being a black man in America. Ready? Hello and welcome back to the Changing the Narrative podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Gabriel Warren, along with co-host Carl Benson. It's a conversation that cuts to the chase. Like, there's a lot of burden that I've come to realize 
walking around this world as a black man. This week, Thomas, an entrepreneur and coach, is the guest. There seems to be a monolithic viewpoint of what a black man is or what a black man is supposed to be. And that is the point of this podcast. It's the collaboration of two members of 100 Black Men, a mentorship nonprofit. Carl, a marketing exec who grew up around mostly white people in North Dakota, and Gabriel, a professor who grew up around mostly black people in Alabama. I was around a lot of black people, a lot of progressive people, a lot of people who were making impacts in their communities, but those weren't the people that I was seeing celebrated on television. For me, I didn't have a network of black men, and the only thing that even I saw was what's on TV. Like you see folks on TV doing this, that, or the other thing, or you see musicians, or you see athletes, but you just didn't see regular guys doing great things. So they just launched Changing the Narrative to amplify the many voices of black men. Black men that are having good jobs, being there for their families, taking care of their kids, you know, giving back to their communities, and I, I wanted to celebrate that. They've talked to the president of a building group, a high school ESL teacher, and Thomas, who runs a grill company. I would be remiss if I just worked on my own and didn't think about us as a whole, right? Tell us a little bit about what you are doing in your community. How do you they are continue? talking with black men, but they are hoping another demographic is listening. I'm building to be a better me. Carl and I were talking about that, and when we were planning it, we were like, you know, the target for this podcast is non-black people, because a lot of people in the black community know this stuff. I feel like this platform gives individuals outside of our culture an opportunity to kind of get a glimpse of what it's like to be a black man in, in, in America. Just the idea, too, of not being afraid to have some of these conversations, is that kind of part of it, too? White folks in general sometimes get a little nervous, I guess, when they start talking about race and race in general, especially black, white kind of stuff. And for me, it's all about relationship building. And I think that ultimately, that's what we hope to do is like, look, you know, I'm, I'm a cool guy. Dr. Warren's a cool guy. Let's just have a conversation and keep it moving. My success is my community's success. A conversation that will go far. Boston's Museum of Fine Arts is celebrating another year of the African American Ball. As Lisa Hughes tells us, it began with a movement to get black history into local schools. <laughs> we met at the old Jamaica Plain High School. This is uh, my alma mater. Where decades earlier, Michael Blakely was among the students who protested to make black history part of the curriculum. We were the first school to in the public school in the city of Boston. That's yeah. amazing. And what left such a major impression, you know, upon me. That activism lit a spark. So this was the first ball. And inspired his creation of the African American ball. Why not educate, show the positive contributions that African Americans have made to our society. It also helped him address the collective pain of losing too many young people to violence. I'm standing in front of the television crying and I'm saying, God, what differently can I do now than the things that I'm already doing to try to make that difference in the lives of our people and our children? The answer is an event that also honors people who support the black community and help students in need. I was like, thank God. Rutgers University freshman Paris Figueroa received last year's scholarship. The fact that I was able to have my first semester paid off because of that last 1500 that he gave me was the most amazing thing ever. Michael's focus on kids and families is also a tribute. My parents were really amazing people. What propels me um, is the values that they instilled. He's the 12th of 13 children. The Mother's Day and Father's Day events he organizes for Roxbury families honor his parents' memory. The ball gives young black artists a chance to shine. It gives us the platform and the opportunity to showcase great talent. And in a new venue, when the dancers from Stages Cultural Arts Center perform, they'll be at the Museum of Fine Arts, a first for the ball and its fashion show. You have the neck piece here, and this is hand painted. His friend, designer Nadra Rod, jumped at the chance to work with Michael again. It is 
beautiful history together. He's a visionary. She'll feature two designs, but not these. And this young designer will make his debut. And I wrote down a lot of outfits, even though not all of them are going to be in the show. 17-year-old Musadik Abdullah is Nadra's son. Does it matter to you that your first show is this ball? Yeah, I think it's special. The meaning behind it, Black History Month, it's a huge deal. Like, that's why I'm so stoked. Michael's mission is to elevate the artist, even as he works through challenges planning and funding the ball. As a black man, I've, I've been through many doors that have been just closed. Regardless of what I bring to the table, those doors still get closed to me. Even now? Even now, even now. But he meets obstacles with resolve. I just want our people to come together. The ball is one of those things that help to give me that hope. What changes because of Michael Blakely? When you have someone so passionate about sharing their energy to make things better from a small level to a big level, everything can move with love. I always told Mr. Blake, I'm like, you really are an angel, like sent from heaven. How does that make you feel? Oh, that, that is the, um, when I'm at my low, they send me high. So that's what they do for me when they allow me to know that I've made some sort of a difference in their lives. Students in Detroit, they are celebrating black history and they're doing it through art. Amir Makeupson shows us how they interpreted the theme of awakening. The important thing what we do is show black art through a black lens and that's all we do. And um, what we like to talk about is content in context. So that experience that you have is a full black experience. Bringing black history to life through art as seen by black artists. That's the purpose of a black history exhibit in Detroit. It's dance, it's music, it's theater, it's the visual arts, it's quilting, it's culinary arts, it's fashion. It's all those kinds of things. But all of the things that we do impact everyone's daily life. And that's a really unique piece to the puzzle. You can't go a day without hearing a piece of music. You can't go a day without putting a sheet or a blanket on. You know, all of those types of things, that is the functionality. Showcased in an environment outside of the classroom that feels a lot like home. It's welcoming and you know, it's almost like going to grandma's house and just feeling that warmth and, and just making memories. Like we're building memories in this space. The hope is to share the culture visually with the community. With this art and all of the art that we do, looking not just to do black for black, but we want uh, people to experience, uh, to experience black art of all colors. Because black history is American history and beyond. I'm from the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and, and a lot of Puerto Rican and Cuban culture is essentially African, Hispanic culture, right? And so that's the culture I was brought up in. And so to then negate that history and that culture, to negates the people, and really is a major step backward in terms of our struggles and how our ancestors have really fought for the right to tell their story. And we wouldn't be where we're at without our ancestors. In Colorado, it's only right that people are learning about black history in a brewery. Tori Mason takes us to a Denver neighborhood looking to revitalize musical traditions. A lot of effort goes into keeping the essence of Five Points alive. Business owners have been especially thoughtful about honoring its history down to their business names. A spangalang is a signature jazz cymbal rhythm. Here, it's a brewery in what used to be the Harlem of the West. It's like a heartbeat. The kind of music you not only hear, but feel. Jazz is rooted in the rhythm of this city, and the sound leads back to Five Points. There's no other neighborhood like it. Norman Harris spends a lot of time on Welton Street, and so have his relatives for generations. Our family has been serving this community for years, and through multiple efforts, it's been a cultural anchor bringing folks back to this neighborhood. When he was a boy, his grandfather owned this liquor store in Five Points. Today, down the same street, Harris is part owner of Spangalang. Is a Spangalang. It's also a jazz themed brewery, a nod to a legacy of music. We had some of the most popular jazz experiences west of the Mississippi River. Terry Gentry at History Colorado still reminisces about that vibrant community. The Rossonian hosted artists like Duke Ellington. My man don't love me. 
Billie Holiday and Nat King Cole. But over time, the music faded. We've had a lot of troubles and challenges in the neighborhood, like it was deemed by city council to be a blighted neighborhood. In the past, Five Points had over 50 bars and clubs. Today, there's just a handful working to keep its legacy alive. You see the folks that honor that history by moving it forward. Harris does it every Friday with jazz nights at Spangalang. Put your hands together for Mr. Gregory Goodlove. The stage has become a platform for new artists with old souls. We're very intentional in terms of curating artists who not only honor the past, but again, look forward to bringing in new groups. No, Five Points isn't the entertainment mecca it used to be, but people like Harris won't let its magic or its music fade. It's our responsibility to hold on to what we can and move it forward. There's one educator in Los Angeles using music to uplift the narratives of black history to students. Sheba Turk tells us more. The Temecula Valley Unified School District made national headlines over its divisive decision to ban critical race theory. Fundamentally, critical race theory examines how racial inequality and systemic racism have played a role in shaping our nation. To date, at least 18 states have restricted education on racism or race-related issues. We are in a time in our country where education is being even more politicized than ever, that we have, you know, people, Moms of Liberty and different groups going to fight in these school board elections and these school board meetings to, to erase the truth of history for fear of discomfort for some students. We are a very inclusive group here at Schoolyard Rap. Griot B is an educator and he has made it his life's mission that students be exposed to all parts of history. It's never really ever been on our end as, as historians, as educators, about making other people uncomfortable, rather just teaching those truths that are important to learn. Because if you don't ever talk about the truth, you can't learn from the truth. In the case right now where they're banning truth, that shows that we, we some scaredy cats. <laughs> should be scared of truth, shouldn't be scared of uh, uh, facts, and more importantly, should be scared of black. Massive your DNA. He was enslaved. Grio B is a former public school teacher, but he doesn't teach in the classroom anymore. Uh, I was a teacher in Inglewood, California, and uh, my class was boring as all heck. One day, one of the kids challenged me in the cafeteria. He said, Mr. Brown, listen to a song, and I listened to it, and it was horrible. And he said, uh, I bet you can't do better. Grio B took the challenge and made an educational rap. The kids were hooked, and so was he. And so I kind of switched my, my style and I started rapping for students, making more songs about U.S. history, world history. The name Grio B came from his newfound mission. So a Griot in West African tradition is a storyteller. Um, and before Islam came to West Africa, we passed our traditions down, our histories down orally. And that's what Griot B does for this generation. He teaches history through music and stories with his company Schoolyard Rap, which he officially established in 2015 to create educational content and offer a perspective that he felt was missing. All we're ever taught is slavery and segregation in schools. <laughs> His current show proves there is so much more to black history. It's very important because they get to learn it in a different way, in a unique way, in a way that they understand and they can hear through music, just speech, rap, and talk, and just all the activity in one. The show is titled More Than a Month. More Than a Month, spelled specifically with two O's, as the Moorish kings, um, you know, who kind of brought Europe light education um, through Spain, a Spanish conquest. The show is basically saying that regardless of Black History Month, we're black every day. This show is a concert. It's a live production, a uh, spectacle of black history. This type of educational content is so important in light of recent attempts to ban the study of black history and culture. There have been restrictions to AP courses for African American studies. There have been bans on books that teach black history and attacks on critical race theory. While race and history have become social and political lightning rods, Griot B has brought his programming to 250 school districts and reached nearly a million students and says that he hasn't gotten any negative feedback. His method of teaching is a celebration of culture and history that gets the students out of their seats and excited about learning. Really, we only hear about the stuff that's in the books and more say it, like we don't really hear from black culture themselves, so it's just more interesting to hear from black culture. Every student should have an opportunity to know how great they can be because they've always been great through history. And so that's why I do all cultures, not just black history. No, no, no.
His shows are about history, but also about representation. Through schoolyard rap, he shows that people of color have a place in our nation's history, not just as slaves, but as contributors in many meaningful and positive ways. It's a perspective that many students won't get in school. An author from Texas is busy exploring historical black figures from the Old West, Karen Borda, with that story. There are history books, and then there are books about untold history. And I said, we really got to capture these stories of African Americans in the West because there are no stories out there. Elizabeth Ann Lawless is an author. She crafts stories of Western legends often overlooked in the pages of time. Their stories weren't told. They were told around the campfire. They were told around the kitchen tables. People in the community knew somebody, but people outside the community did not know them. She's speaking of the African-American trailblazers of the Old West, the soldiers, the ranchers, the cowboys, whose paths solidified their standings as more than just a footnote in history. They paved the way for progress west of the Mississippi, pioneers like Kathy Williams. She was the only female Buffalo soldier. She signed up and she signed up as Williams Kathy because she knew that they were gonna say Private Kathy, they were gonna call her by name and she didn't wanna make up a name and then not respond correctly. Williams would serve two years before it was discovered she was a woman. She was banished to a post 190 miles away to muster out in hopes of keeping her service a secret. But her cousins knew, but they were about the only ones, but people were beginning to whisper and, you know, and rumor. William's story is just one of 16 fascinating legends from the past and present Lawless researched, including influential characters like Cleo Hearn, the founder of the Cowboys of Color Rodeo. Every Western icon is colorfully illustrated, their history adapted for young readers. They were real people. And they lived these extraordinary lives. Her pages unlock a portal in time, knowing the key to our future is written in our past. When kids see somebody that looks like them, they think I can do it too. Karen Borda, CBS News. As a young black woman who comes from a family of a strong black and prominent entrepreneurs, black history is something that is so sacred to me. I was taught that to whom much is given, much is required. And that is something I live by. It's something that drives me to learn more and teach others about the depth and importance of black contributions to American culture. We are passionate about these stories and will continue to share them. I will. From a local business owner to an educator and beyond, those everyday heroes are the fabric of our communities and their stories deserve to be told.